Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure to be seated here tonight with the extraordinary Frank Zappa. Frank, welcome to Tomorrow Coast to Coast. Why, thank you. All right. You have a large and loyal following. But for those who are not all that familiar with you, how would you describe your work? Uh, it's entertainment. Mm-hmm. It's specialized entertainment. Specialized entertainment. For, for what specialty? For people who are tired of other types of entertainment. We have specialized entertainment. Mick Jagger once said that if he were doing satisfaction at the age of 40, he would kill himself, and yet you keep on rocking and rolling. I make no bones about the fact that I am 40 years old, but I don't have any suicidal tendencies, and I like what I'm doing, and since I've been doing it a long time, I had a lot of practice, and I'm real good at it. Have you felt a necessity to change the music over the years? I change the music every year because the band changes every year. We audition every year, usually in June, and people from out of nowhere can get in the band and wind up touring and making records. You're one of the most accomplished musicians active today. Why don't you sit down and write a top 40 hit song sometime? I could do it if I wanted, but even if I did, the chances of it getting played on a top 40 radio station are not very good. Why is that? Because of the attitudes of programmers and uh, there's a certain political rigmarole that one must go through in order to have a top 40 record, including special types of presence to certain people in the industry. And that's uh, something that I don't wish to be involved in. Frank, you once wrote a song called Jewish Princess, which resulted in a lot of unpleasantness being uh, directed towards you by various Jewish organizations. Was it all worth it? It's a fine song, and if you're a Jewish princess and you haven't heard it yet, it's on the Shake Your Booty album. You go out there and listen to it, and remember that until somebody writes a song about you, you don't exist. <laughs> And I wrote a song about Jewish princesses, and I provided certification for the whole bunch of you. It's got all of your stuff in there. It tells about what you do with your zits, what you do with your nose, what you do with every part of your body. I care. I wrote a song about you. And what do I get for my trouble? The ADL jumps up and down. Ungrateful wretches. <laughs> a lot of people have associated you, rightly or wrongly, with the drug culture that came into being in the 60s, about the same time as your music first became prominent. A lot of people thought that that drug culture was a good thing. Were they wrong about that? I think so. First of all, I have nothing to do with the drug culture. I don't uh, espouse it in any way. I don't use drugs. I don't advise other people to use drugs. And a lot of the things that I think are wrong with the society today are a direct result of people using drugs. It's so prevalent that if you don't use drugs, people think you're weird. I understand that you're about to have an article that you wrote printed in High Times, a leading magazine of the drug culture. This will be the second time that they've had something in, in their publication. Do you feel any uh, remorse about dealing with them? Not at all, because the first thing that was printed in there was an article about my views on drugs, and, and what a better place to put it than in a, in a publication that goes directly to people who crave drugs. And in this article that I had in there before, I expressed all the reasons why I didn't care for drugs, drug culture, and so on and so forth. And this present uh, piece that they're going to be running deals with uh, things of a sociological nature that might be useful for the people who already use drugs to see another point of view. I mean, basically, that publication is very, it's pro-drug. And uh, the people who read it are getting only one side of the picture. And I think that it's uh, fair and also interesting that the publication would include, uh, include other points of view. Back to music, you've assimilated a lot of different styles of music into your own work, such as classical and jazz and rock and roll. But I've read that R&B is really your favorite. Is that yes, true? Yes, that's very true. Why? I just like the way it sounds. Just like I like a cup of coffee, and I like uh, rhythm and blues. And it's very rare to find people who uh, appreciate that kind of music. I mean, what 
most people today know about the music of the 50s is all sha na -na derived uh, sort of freeze-dried uh, and very, it's been tidied up quite a bit. But I like the, the old rough stuff. You've often talked about the difference between white people's music and black people's music. Which kind is yours? Well, most of the um, black people's music of the 50s I enjoyed. A lot of the black people's music of today I do not enjoy because it sounds like white person music to me. It has white person values and it has uh, white person commerciality to it. What do you see as the white person values? The... Anything that reminds you a little bit of Pat Boone. If you can hear a white buck shoe in a background someplace or a leisure suit, you know, that's what I mean. Frank, let's break for a commercial message. When we return, I'd like to cover some territory that may be quite new for even the Zappa watchers in our audience. Frank's work as a filmmaker. Stay with us.